Educators Lead, Episode 133. Don't ignore the elephant in the room. That's a huge part of what makes me successful as a tutor is like I meet with a kid. I know right away like, oh, you don't know any math. Like we got to fix that. Like I'm not going to just preach at you about something I care about. I'm, I'm going to pay attention to what's, what's really going on. Welcome to Educators Lead, where we interview leaders in education to offer inspiration and practical advice to help launch educators into the next level of leadership. I'm your host, Jay Willis, and I want to thank you for subscribing to our show. This is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and you're listening to Educators Lead. Let's join my friend Jay Willis and get ready to take your leadership to the next level. Hello, Edge Leaders. Jay Willis here, and I'm excited to introduce our featured guest today, Matt Bardeen. Matt, are you ready? I am so ready, Jay. All right. Matt Bardeen taught high school and middle school in the New York City public schools in the early 1990s and was a founding director of Teach for America. He founded Veritas Tutors, now Zinc Educational Services in 2001. He was a co-founder in 2008 of High Five Labs, a company that produced a few popular apps, and he founded Zinc Learning Labs to make the key element of an elite education, advanced literacy, widely available. So that's just a real brief introduction, Matt, but tell us a little bit more about yourself. Uh, yeah, well, I, um, I came to New York right after college and I managed to get a teaching license, which, you know, they, they needed teachers back then. Um, and I taught for four years in the public schools in New York. I was involved in the beginnings of Teach for America, uh, if people know what that is. Um, But, um, you know, my license was English. I ended up teaching all kinds of things, but I mostly was an English teacher. And um, I guess that my story is just, I love teaching. I love being in the classroom. And at the same time, I found it incredibly frustrating because I always felt like there were just, you know, those kids that you just couldn't reach. And um, I always felt like the kids who sat in front and had their hand up were, were really enjoying my class and that there were plenty of kids who uh, seemed to be getting very little out of the experience. Mm. And that always kind of bugged me. And uh, then I became a tutor. And tutoring is a very different experience from classroom teaching because, uh, well, obviously it's one-on-one, but also um, – you know, I had to deliver results. And, you know, most people think of test prep as being a bunch of tricks and shortcuts and whatnot. And I learned very quickly that those just don't work, Jay. Um, I mean, they work for a handful of kids, but not for most students. And Mm -hmm. what I came to realize was that a lot of it was, uh, was just down to how people read and think. Uh, but mostly how they read and the kids who read comfortably and enjoy reading find school kind of a breeze, you know, which was kind of my experience. Mm. Um, and I always wondered when I was a kid, you know, I had friends who seemed to work really hard and not do as well as I did. And I knew I wasn't smarter than they were, you know? Um, and then as a tutor, what I discovered was just, there's this enormous drop off in, uh, reading comprehension, right around middle school, probably. Um, I mean, sometimes it starts earlier or whatever. And so much of these things are down to development. And the thing that's really hard as a teacher is, you know, you might have like, I had like 30, 35 kids in my class and they could range in ability level from, you know, like nowhere, like basically a first, second grade reading level to someone who could read on a college level. So, um, you know, uh, there's very little that you can do to uh, really reach all those kids. Hmm. And um, in tutoring, I have the privilege of working one-on-one. And so, you know, I, I realized like, okay, I have to figure out how to move the pile on this, you know, and turn uh, these students into readers. And 
it took many years and I have, you know, a whole team of other tutors now who are working with me on this and we talk about it and, you know, kind of figure out different things that work. Um, but what I've been doing over the last couple of years is building these online tools that uh, are in many classrooms, Zinc Reading Labs, um, and we're partnered with the College Board's uh, Springboard curriculum. And so we have, uh, you know, thousands of kids using it now. And basically, it's just right now, it's just vocabulary and reading. And, and you know, the way I get kids reading is I give them something that I think is great to read. Um, so the hard part with that is it's, you know, it's hard to find something super easy um, that is going to be really stimulating and exciting, especially for a teenager. Um, but there are things out there. And then, of course, we, we teach them close reading skills. And we're very excited about uh, a set of online close reading games that we're, we're piloting right now. We're prototyping right now. And uh, that's one thing that we'd like to invite the Jay Willis listeners to uh, either participate in a pilot, help us test and develop these um, close reading tools, um, or have a free pilot of all the tools um, for the rest of the year. So if people want to email us, then we would uh, offer that. But I feel like I, I just kind of ran through the whole thing, didn't I? <laughs> well, that's all right. We'll, we'll backtrack and we'll kind of dig in deeper in, uh, in you know, each different section here. Uh, okay. Well, so Sounds first good. off, so, you know, I guess, you know, before we kind of jump into unpacking uh, your story a little bit, what would be maybe something interesting about yourself that most people wouldn't know? Huh. Uh, I'm a, a boxer. Yeah, really? Yeah, I go to a Gleason's gym. Wow. I was there this morning. I don't really box very much. To tell you the truth, I had a head injury when I was a kid. And my <laughs> doctor pointed out last spring that it's probably not a good idea to get hit in the head, uh -huh. uh, even with uh, headgear and boxing gloves on. But uh, I love boxing, and uh, I have gotten hit in the head quite a bit. Um, but whatever. Uh, it's a great sport, uh, an incredible workout. So. Yeah. Well, yeah. So we have uh, at the office where I work and it was actually my campaign to get it in place. We have a heavy bag and then a speed bag uh, oh, really? that I like to hit. And my dad used to compete or he was, you know, he did golden gloves for a while wow. and, uh, around the Kansas city area. And so he taught me when I was growing up, we were in a small town. And so there, there wasn't really an opportunity for me to join a gym or anything there, but we had kind of a gym in our basement and friends would come over and we'd spar and we'd hit the, hit the bag, you know, the heavy bag and then the speed bag. And, uh, anyway, it was, it was pretty fun. It's really a great workout for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Um, well, that's, that's really neat. Gleason's gym is that, is that like a famous gym? It is. I mean, you know, it's kind of like a mix of real boxers. And uh, I mean, Mike Tyson came out of Gleason's wow. gym. Wow. That's neat. Um, and uh, it's been around forever. And it's kind of a mix of like, just like people working out and there, there's a culture there. It's, it's a great atmosphere. People are really friendly and uh, you meet all kinds of characters and um, and you sweat a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I bet that's neat. If, so, so you run into, you bump into some, uh, professional boxers there sometimes. Yeah, I do. Um, I mean, I, I uh, I'm trying to think, I mean, I was trained by Peter Quillen, um, wow. who was a middleweight champion for a while. He's working on a comeback right now. And, uh, there are a lot of women boxers there, Heather Hardy, um, uh, I'm trying to remember. I just know people's first names. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, yeah. but yeah, there are, there are a bunch of pros and some great trainers there. Hector Roca. I, I don't know who Hector trained, but I feel like he's trained a lot of big, a, bit, a lot of big boxers. Wow. So. Yeah. That's really neat. Wow. Well, so, so I guess, you know, at what point kind of in your journey, so you were teaching a classroom and then I guess you got the bug, you, you started tutoring a little bit and that's kind of when the, the shift happened for you in like, you kind of transitioned your way of thinking a little bit. Is that kind of yeah, accurate? Yeah, a lot. Yeah. Transitioned it a lot. I mean, it's just, I think it's very hard as a classroom teacher. To me, the hardest thing is just the, you know, I guess they call it differentiation now, right? Like finding ways to engage kids who have completely different needs, especially as an English teacher, you know? Um, so, 
and, and in tutoring, like I, I, it's so easy compared to uh, classroom teaching, you know, because you're just dealing with one person. I mean, it can be very, very hard. It takes a lot of energy and, you know, it's a very challenging thing to actually uh, do it effectively, you know, and it took me a long time to figure out like, no, you gotta, you gotta bring this kid along from exactly where they are, you know? Hmm. Um, so, so now, uh, what we're doing at zinc is we're, we're taking what we learn from, uh, tutoring and we're, we're making online tools because those are also one-on-one, right? Like if you have a laptop cart in your classroom, then the tools that, uh, that that card should provide should be able to really help you with that, you know, in terms of meeting kids where they're at. Well, so tell me this, how do you take a child who is just not a reader? Like who just doesn't, you know, like it seems like a painful thing. Maybe not that they can't do it. Maybe they just really are not interested. Maybe their comprehension or maybe they're just their, uh, you know, <laughs> ability to stay focused on it. They just don't like to read. Like how do you take them from that to, and because I'm sure you have some great success stories and you've seen, you know, the light bulb come on on some a lot of kids' faces. But like, how do you take them from no interest in reading to being interested uh, and helping them, you know, develop better, better comprehension and all of that? Like, how do you right. how That's does that transition awesome happen? Question. OK, so first of all, um, what, what what I think I, I would want all of your listeners and the whole country to understand is like not only is that common, it's normal. Right. Like most people are not comfortable reading beyond a certain level. Mm -hmm. And there's a big difference between reading, you know, like a YA novel, even which even that, you know, granted, a lot of kids wouldn't want to read and reading, you know, uh, The Grapes of Wrath or Shakespeare or whatever is being assigned in class. And the reason kids don't want to do that is that it's very difficult. Like you're, we're asking them, we're asking a lot of most people. And I think one of the issues is that we as teachers, for the most part, are people who had success as readers. And so it's very hard to really wrap your head around just how difficult that is for, uh, I, I would argue, the majority. Um, and I think the statistics, you know, back me up in that. Um, also, obviously, we're up against the phones and the screens now in this enormous industry that's looking to... Uh, um, you know, just make everything as easy as possible. And, you know, so part of what I do is I am preaching to my students, like, don't give in to that. You know, that's just stupid. Like, you don't want that. Like, you don't want to just be entertained. You know, like you have to want to do something challenging because I never promise them that, oh, this is just really easy. But the way the simple answer to your question is I find something that I know will actually be hard for them, but that if they will work their way through it, it'll, it'll blow their minds. Right. So I have certain texts that I like to use and, you know, it's different with different students. Although to be honest, the key ingredient is something that I think is amazing, you know, um, that I'm excited about and I can, you know, get them excited about. And then I teach them how to read it. So it's not about me explaining it. Right. I think that's a, a huge mistake that, um, a lot of tutors make, frankly, it's just like, oh, like I understand this. Let me tell you what it means. And yeah, modeling is a big part of learning, but like ultimately, when I succeed, it's because I got a kid to do it themselves. Mm. And, um, you know, I like to read. Do you like to read? I do. Yeah, I don't <laughs> I don't carve out enough time. I was going to say I don't have enough time, but it's like you have time for what you prioritize, right? And so mm -hmm. I don't carve out enough time in my mind sufficient for me to read as much as I'd like to. But, yes, I do enjoy reading. Right. So for you, like you're saying, oh, I'd like to carve out more time for it because you know that if you find the right book – like, oh, there's nothing more satisfying, you know, it's right. like, it's, or even like an article or an essay, you know, you're an educator, you, you might like a lot of stuff that gets written, it's probably, you know, it's boring, you don't want to read it. But <laughs> like, occasionally, there's something that's like, wow, that's really cool, you know, and so it's just, why would you read it? Because you can't, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. it's like, it's a fun thing to do. And not fun, as in like, you know, having a few beers at a barbecue or just watching, you know, a game, something passively entertaining, but it's fun in a deeply satisfying way. Mm. So like, 
as educators, I think we want to keep that in mind, but then we want to make that experience happen for a student. So that's what I do with a student. I give them something way above their pay grade, but then I get them to understand it by getting them, you know, A, to do first and foremost what we call zinking, um, which is just taking the words off the page and turning them into images and meanings in their heads. Right. And that's the thing that I think we all take for granted because that's just not happening for most people. Mm. And, you know, we start with that. We start with just the visual. Right. Like look for words you can easily picture and then look for what we call key images. Like a great writer is going to give you stuff that really resonates. You know, they're not going to just say like, oh, um, you know, uh, the boat came into the harbor, they're going to, they're going to give you some, some flavor and some color around that. That's going to make you feel things and mm-hmm. make you experience it in a different way. And when you're taking that writer's consciousness off the page and experiencing that, that's a kind of higher level pleasure, you know? Um, so the successes that I have are, are going to boil down to that. It's going to, it's that moment where a kid is like, wait a minute, I, not only do I get this, but this is really cool. You know, I'm like, I really like this. And uh, then they're going to read something on their own. So, you know, sometimes that comes out of figuring out, well, what would really interest you? And sometimes it comes totally out of left field. You know, like it's not something that's like, oh, you're into sports. So I'm reading this story about this athlete or something. Not at all. I'm giving you Camus to read. (laughs) (laughs) Here's like two guys sitting at a bar talking in Amsterdam, like in the 1950s. Yeah. Like, why would that interest you? You're into video games and football. But it does. You know, if you understand it, it does. It's it's just cool. Well, isn't a lot of, at least my experience with reading and stories. Now, I read a lot of nonfiction because it helped, you know, things that help me develop more as a person. I read a lot of that kind of stuff. But, Mm -hmm. you know, talking about, uh, fiction, or even if it's, uh, you know, a, a biography or whatever it is, which I do, I, I guess I read biographies too, but, um, like, you know, what, what, uh, what would you say is, um, or I guess a question I had, how do you, what's the best way to increase vocabulary? I know that, you know, the more you read, probably the better your vocabulary you have, but what have you found? Are there certain like strategies or techniques? I mean, what, what helps people develop better vocabulary? Well, I mean, way to throw me a softball, Jay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think reading a lot obviously helps. Um, but I, I really believe in actually studying vocabulary. And so, you know, we've built a great vocabulary tool that's part of Zinc Learning Labs that um, uses you know, multiple modalities, first of all, so that you're not just memorizing a definition, right? Um, You're seeing images, you're using the word in a context, you're uh, playing different games, or you're dragging and dropping the word, um, and you're learning the definition. Um, But the key thing uh, to that is that you're seeing it multiple times and over time. So if you really want to learn something and retain it, you really, uh, the way memory works is it's very easy to get things in a short term memory. So, you know, like when we were kids, they might give you a vocabulary quiz. And I don't know if you were like me, like you just learned it the night before or the morning of on the school bus, you know, and like those words were gone by 24, 48 hours later. So the way memory works is, You can easily upload something to short-term memory. If you want to keep it, you've got to revisit it. You've got to let it almost fade from memory and then come back to it and then hit it again over a period of weeks. So, um, you know, my my first venture into technology was building an iPhone app that did that, uh, spaced repetition, because then you know the words. And the idea is that once you've acquired those words, you know, you're still not going to remember them really if you don't use them, you know, if you don't see them in a context and say, oh, wow, you know, and I also see that as like a a way into reading. I've had a lot of success where because the vocab part of our uh, tools is, you know, I don't want to say it's gamified, you know, it's not like playing you know, whatever games kids play, I'm not into that. So I couldn't tell you, but, you know, but it has those elements and there's a leaderboard and, 
you know, when I've used it in classes that I've taught, often the kid who takes over the leaderboard is not like the champion English student reader kind of kid. It's a kid who plays a lot of video games and is competitive and likes to see their name at the top of that board. And so uh, for that kid, it's also a way in because then when they're reading and they're like, oh, ambivalent, I know what that means. I learned that word, you know. Mm. And then instead of it shutting them out, it's a feeling of pride. Um, so like all the research shows that vocabulary is the key to advanced literacy in the sense that, you know, if you see, I think it's something like 2% of the words on the page, if, they're, if you don't know what they are, uh, and this is true of terminology as well. Um, so, you know, we're building a whole lot of those, just language. Like, you know, we're, we're piloting with uh, code.org a bunch of computer terminology, right? Because if you're ha- being asked to read and learn and there are uh, context-specific vocabulary that you don't know, like, that's it. You're not getting it. You're just going to shut down. You're going to feel stupid. And, you know, no one's actually stupid. Like, as a species, we're pretty smart, you know. Uh, I'm sorry, all due respect to the chimpanzees. Like, (laughs) they don't have what we have between our ears. Right. And, like, so things like vocabulary are absolutely essential. um, But, again, it takes effort. And, uh you know, and then I think seeing it in context, hearing it used and all that is, is all of a sudden rewarding instead of being, you know, a brick in the face. Now, do you feel like or maybe do your apps spend any time, you know, helping the kids learn like roots and like Latin maybe or anything like that? Do you feel like oh, I have a we have a six uh, sixth grader. Uh, he's 11 years old and he's taking Latin and uh, mm. I'm amazed. It seems like he just complicated what I think are complicated words he's able to kind of figure out uh, Mm -hmm. just by Mm -hmm. what the Latin that he's had and he'll kind of like Mm -hmm. break a word apart have you found that that's helpful Uh, and have you used that with some of your apps Uh, you know I haven't used that myself but we do have that in the app and it makes sense to me that it'd be incredibly helpful Uh, you know for me I took Spanish when I was in school and I definitely learned from that um even though it's not Latin, but they're still related words. Um, and I played a lot of Dungeons and Dragons. So, <laughs> you know, you'd see those words pop up. But like, yeah. um, I, I, I would throw everything, including the kitchen sink at this. But I've definitely heard from certain teachers that roots are essential. So I'm not sure if it's on our app yet or if we're building it, but um, we do have that. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think for your for your sixth grader, like taking the Latin in school is, you know, really making, uh, making him understand those roots. So uh, anything that makes you actually turn it into a meaning in your head, mm. that's when the real learning happens. Right. Right. Well, I, I know we're running low on time. But there's a couple more things. I, I wanted... actually have time now. This oh. group, my meeting just got pushed back. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, so I guess, a couple of questions I had. I was curious about, tell us, I guess, a little bit more about Teach for America and your role in kind of being a founding director there. <laughs> okay. I mean, I was, um, I, I vaguely knew Wendy Kopp uh, from college. And then I knew a bunch of people that were the early people. And I was just like the guy they knew who was an actual teacher. <laughs> so I, <laughs> Um, and I would go in there and, you know, um, uh, honestly, I, I, I was sort of like, I was a guy saying, uh-huh. And how is all this helping, you know, students learn and stuff. And it was hard to answer that question. Um, I was part of the first summer Institute and I wrote a whole, uh, curriculum for the the training Institute that was focused around, uh, group learning and having the trainees all work together, uh, to put, uh, a curriculum together for the specifically for the classrooms they were going into um, because I thought that would help them a lot to really wrap their heads around um, the kinds of uh, kinds of situations they were getting into, which I think was really, really challenging. Um, and, you know, and then I left teaching and I became a tutor and I wasn't very involved after that. Um, although I, I, you know, intermittently we've, we've, uh, done things with teach for America. And I certainly have a lot of TFA alums on my staff. 
Um, and uh, I think it's an amazing, amazing organization and uh, has accomplished enormous amounts. Of course, when people criticize them, it's like, oh, they haven't solved everything. <laughs> like, what's wrong with them? And I love when people do that with school in general. It's like, uh, you know, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Well, so anybody who maybe isn't familiar, just kind of a brief, what is Teach for America? If anybody yeah, hasn't so heard of Teach it. for America, Wendy Kopp, the founder of Teach for America, as her senior thesis at Princeton, uh, came up with this idea that there should be uh, like a Peace Corps for teachers, that kids t- graduating, you know, at the top of their college class should be encouraged, you know, instead of like the Peace Corps going overseas to dig wells and, you know, developing world or whatever, like we have a need right here in the USA to go teach in underserved communities, rural and urban communities back then, uh, where there were teacher shortages. Hmm. Um, and so she wrote this senior thesis and she did it. So, uh, you know, she was an incredible force is an incredible force, uh, and put together this huge organization that staffs hundreds of teachers every year. And, um, you know, uh, I was, I, I had similar ideas. It's funny. Uh, like I graduated from, from college. And like I said, I was just like, Oh, I'll go teach. And then I was teaching. I was like, you know, this would be a really good thing. Cause I saw other people marching off to job interviews of all sorts and everything. And I thought, well, this is much cooler than, you know, working at a bank or whatever. Uh, of course you make far less money, but, um, <laughs> you know, it still was like, it seemed like something that other young people would think would be a good idea. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't have the kind of uh, entrepreneurship that she had back then. And to be honest, as I think about it over the years, like teaching was so hard, you know, like I think once I got in there, I, I couldn't really go out and like preach to everyone, oh, you should all come and do this, you know. Uh, I mean, I could, but I, I didn't have the the passion of the true believer that it would have taken. And in a way, the fact that Wendy, I think she did do some teaching uh, after several years of running this organization, you know, the fact that she was just a college kid was like, saw a need and was like, come on, we got to do this. You know, uh, that's part of what made it a success. I think as a teacher, you're up against so much and it takes so much energy to just keep up with every day that, uh, it would have been very hard for me or anyone else in the classroom to get something like that off the ground. Yeah. Yeah, well, so I guess jumping back into your own kind of personal story, what would Mm. you say, you know, what was one of the biggest, I guess, what was the most difficult part of your journey so far? Like in, you know, as far as your career goes, whether it was in education or even taking Mm. on this, this new role that you're currently in, what would you say was the most difficult part of the journey? And then how did you overcome some of those challenges that came (laughs) <laughs> I don't know, Jay. I, I'd say I'm in it right now, man. Like, uh, I think the most difficult thing was to just totally commit to this reading thing. You know, I mean, I'm uh, funding it myself. Uh, I'm taking an enormous, enormous risk because I really believe in it. So uh, about four or five years ago, I just stuck my foot in the ground. And it's always the hardest thing is always those first steps, you know, and like I made so many mistakes and I hired the wrong people and Um, but I think, uh, probably faith was the main thing, like just feeling like, okay, I have to do this no matter what. And I have to stick with it and I have to learn from my mistakes and, uh, you know, things like boxing, I feel like have taught me a lot, um, just to be persistent with something because I'm like terrible at it, (laughs) you know? And I think it's very good for you to do something that that's bad, that you're bad at and stick with it and struggle with it and see yourself improve because this is an enormous undertaking. So like, I don't feel like a success story just yet. You know, I feel like I'm on my way and I've taken the crucial baby steps. Mm. Um, and I think that's the hardest part of doing anything, but I think, you know, I face enormous obstacles. I mean, (laughs) Like the things I was just talking to you about, about reading, like 
I don't think anybody but me, I mean, I don't think I'm the only person who sees it that way, but it's certainly not a, a part of the culture, right? And so the only way this is going to succeed is if, if we at Zinc can create the tools that will empower people who are like, yeah, I want to lead the reading revolution. I want to fight back against, you know, this onslaught of kind of the – well, I call it the dopamine drip, you know, of like Snapchat and Instagram and stuff that grabs your attention and just holds it on right. this kind of low level and doesn't really feed you anything. Right. Um, so I, I'm quite certain that reading can have a huge impact on that. Um, so, you know, I'm building these tools and it's like a kind of, if you build it, they, what was the field of dreams? If you build it, they will come. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. you know, I need, uh, I need the, the people to come to it. I, I feel like we've got a great start um, and largely due to the uh, partnership with Springboard, uh, the college board curriculum. Yeah. Uh, just get, gives us a foot in the door and there are amazing teachers out there who are uh, u- using our, what we're building and giving us feedback and, you know, um, it's very, very gratifying to see, you know, 10,000 kids per day. Oh yeah. Uh, on the app. Yeah. Learning. Well, I'm excited that we can be part of the springboard to help launch this thing, uh, you know, into, into orbit, outer orbit, you know, wherever, well, whatever awesome. metaphor. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I know you've been doing this for a while and obviously you're very passionate about it. I am sure by this point you have some amazing stories to share of the impact that you've been able to witness and kind of be a part of. But if you could just take us to like your best story or one of your best moments or best stories and share that with us. Um, well, I mean, this isn't actually something I personally witnessed, but um, the uh, e- the ELA lead on Springboard t- tells this story about zinc and being in a classroom in uh, an inner city school in a kind of a tough school situation and seeing a class full of kids uh, using the zinc apps. And, um, they're completely silent. Like you can hear a pin drop because they're sitting there on their Chromebooks reading and learning vocabulary and, uh, the bell rings and the teacher has the leaderboard up on the screen there and the bell rings and nobody moves. (laughs) And she's like, uh, guys, you have to go. And they're like, shh, like they're trying to, Uh, you know, beat each other on the leaderboard. Um, but they're doing it by learning. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't know where it's going to lead. I I hope to come back on your show in you know, uh, five years and the whole situation in the country will be different with regard to reading. So, yeah. Yeah. And you can, you definitely sounds like you're working to become a significant part of that. So that's, that's pretty awesome. Well, so I know that, you know, in the role that you're in, obviously you're in a leadership role. And, uh, and so a lot of the listeners here are either Mm. leaders in education or they're interested in becoming leaders in education. And Mm. so, uh, I kind of, with that in mind, I'm going to roll through some rapid fire questions. If you're ready for those. Sure. So first off, what would you say is the best leadership advice you've ever received? That's a tough one. I'm trying to think of leadership advice. I mean, I think just believe in your own truth and and be willing to stand up for it. I'm not sure who told me that, but uh, I think that's very profound. You know, like if you see, like for me, it's like, okay, well, nobody's talking about this reading thing, really. I don't hear anybody else in the test prep business worrying about it, but like, that's what I'm seeing. That's what I'm going to do. You know, I'm going to solve a a real problem, like no BS. Well, and that's what I was going to follow up with. The question is, how do you distinguish your belief, like what, what really, how you're wired versus just kind of random thoughts? Like what, you know, how Mm -hmm. do you distinguish between something that um, is at your core, something you're passionate about versus just kind of random, ah, that's a neat idea. Uh, like, how do you distinguish well, between those two? I guess for me, it comes out of experience. You know, like I'm, I had these ideas, like they grew out of tutoring 
Um, and, but I tested them, you know, like I was like, huh, you know, I think your score will go up if you, if you actually read something, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and then it really did. So, um, you know, I, I didn't actually, I wasn't like a huge advocate of reading or anything before this. Like I, it happened for me out of experience. It wasn't like, you know, I, I didn't even realize it was really a problem. Like, I think like most people, I felt like, oh, those kids sitting in the back, they're just lazy, you mm -hmm. know, like, why aren't they working harder? And then, you know, these ideas grew out of the experience. I mean, I think I'm a born teacher, like I'm passionate about helping other people. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, but you know what I'm talking about, right? right? Like, right. Like, it's just incredibly gratifying to see them succeed. But I also find it incredibly painful when they don't. Hmm. Um, so, you know, I, this isn't just like, oh, I like reading. I think it's cool. So you should do it. Um, but I don't know. Did I answer your question? Yeah. I, I mean, it sounds like the litmus test is something that if it's, you know, if it's something that persists over time, like it just it keeps coming you know, it seems like you just keep coming back to it. Like, here's a problem. Here's a problem. Here's a problem. Uh, here's something I'm passionate about. And here's a problem. And so I think that uh, something persistent and obviously I think you had kind of touched on this too, something you could kind of test uh, as well, yeah. you know, yeah. and the reason I'm asking that question, cause like we get a lot of harebrained ideas, right? Just in general, mm -hmm. usually people just kind of get a bunch of random ideas and it's probably not a great thing to just bet the farm on every random idea that you have. <laughs> and no, so, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And so like distinguishing between something that, that is really kind of a core, uh, thing that you're passionate about versus just kind of a random fleeting thought. That's kind of what I was getting at. Yeah. 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 No, I don't have anything like that. I mean, it's funny, like actually now that I think about it, like the best leadership advice in a way, I wasn't really leadership advice, but you know, um, uh, the, it, the advice was like, focus on one thing, like focus on your thing. I don't know if that's great advice for people who want to run schools or be superintendents or whatever, cause they got to focus on a lot of things. Mm. But, um, for me it was good advice because it was like, you know, I, I definitely have ideas about math and other things too. And there's a whole other part of what we do in test prep. That's about how to think more effectively. That's, you know, a little bit in the apps we're building, but I'm, I'm staying with reading until I really have uh, a great um, impact on that. And then there are other things that, that we can roll out later and focus on later. But, you know, like, find something that is meaningful that you can contribute and then really pursue that. Like, and, and it's meaningful and you can contribute because yeah, like you've seen that it matters and that it can make a difference. Like that's leadership, right? Like yeah. if you realize like in your district, like, huh, we're only focused on X and we have a huge problem with Y, like, and you're going to make that your passion. Like, because you know it really matters, then I think that's great, you know? Like another thing that we say is don't ignore the elephant in the room. That's a huge part of it. That's a huge part of what makes me successful as a tutor is like I meet with a kid, I know right away, like, oh, you don't know any math. Like we gotta fix that. Like I'm not gonna just preach at you about something I care about. I'm, I'm gonna pay attention to what's, what's really going on. Going back to just what you're talking about, focusing on one thing, you know, I've heard a couple different things. One, I think it was Zig Ziglar who said, don't be a wandering generality, be a meaningful specific, you mm -hmm. know, just like targeted instead of just kind of like, well, you know, I'm interested in a whole bunch of different things uh, to instead find when. So, and then I've heard it kind of another way uh, to be super effective, just to go like one inch wide, but then to go a mile deep. So, and that doesn't necessarily mean you're just going to stay there. Like you said, go down that path with reading and go as far as you can on that path and then maybe move on to something else that's in, you know, related. Uh, but to really be targeted and specific and focused, uh, and that's how you become an expert. That's how you become great at something is just focusing on that one thing for a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think also in education, there is, um, like I didn't come on any of this overnight. Like it's years of experience and um, learning from mistakes and also finding what I'm great at, you know, like, so um, 
you know, I had a whole other career as a screenwriter. I did, I built these other apps, like, you know, but I love teaching. Like that's, that's where I say I put my foot in the ground. Like, I'm like, okay, this is what you can do, Matt. So like commit to that, you know, like I'm not going to be a professional boxer. (laughs) Um, So doc says no. (laughs) Yeah. Doc says no. And reality says no, you know? Um, so like, I, I, I really liked the idea of being a rock star at one point, Jay, you know? Wow. And I went to my gym teacher in fifth grade and asked him about, you know, NFL football and I'm a good sized guy. I'm six, five, you know, like I have a frame that maybe I could have been a tight end or offensive lineman or something, you know, but it didn't happen and it's not going to happen. So it's not about like some dream. It's about you know, matching what you care about with mm. what your uh, skills are, you know? Mm. Love it. Well, so what would you say, going back, you just kind of alluded to it. What would you say is your biggest strength as an educator? I care. Yeah. Uh, I, I care and I think I'm kind of psychic too, probably. <laughs> How do you mean? I mean, like, I just know things about, like, if I'm meeting with a student, like, I just understand kind of where they're coming from. So, um, I, I would say actually it's three things. It's one, being able to tune in what's really going on and not, like, uh, not just ignoring the elephant in the room, right? Two, uh, really caring about it. And three, I'm really competitive. Like, I really like to win. <laughs> So, um, those three things, you know, they make me kind of dangerous. <laughs> well, so what one or two books would you most recommend? Huh, for educators? Right. Um, well, I have been, uh, <laughs> that's, that's a funny question to be asking me. I mean, I'm reading underground railroad right now. It's an awesome book. And I think it's really, uh, you know, that book, uh, I'm trying to remember it. As soon as you said it, Paulson, I was like, it seems Paulson like Whitehead I I and won the Pulitzer prize, I think, uh, last year, or the year before. Yeah. Um, but, um, in terms of understanding reading, you know, I just read this book, Daniel Willingham, the reading mind. Okay. Um, and there's another word reading at the speed of light, I want to say, or sound by a guy at Wisconsin named Seidenberg. I don't have it in front of me. Um, but those are both great. Uh, and then if you really want to like go, uh, Go for it. A book I really love is called The Conscious Mind by Zoltan Torre. And it's a tough read. It's, it's like a workout to read this book, but it's just fascinating about um, how the brain uh, works and how consciousness works oh, and yeah. what makes us different from animals. Um, and uh, it actually informs a lot of things. But I doubt busy admin are going to want to pick that up. But if you want to understand reading, uh, Seidenberg and Willingham are excellent. Willingham's a little more immediate and accessible. Um, and it's a quicker read and it would give you a lot of insights about, I mean, the problem with all of these people is they focus, they think learning how to read is, is just, you know, learning to read, which in my book is like, pretty much everyone's going to do that at some point, you know, if they get the right stimulus. And to me, the big challenge is getting kids to be, you know, advanced level readers to be capable of reading Mr. Willingham's book, for instance, right. you know, which is very rare in our society. It's like, we're all focused on getting everyone riding a tricycle, but I, I feel like we all need to be on a mountain bike on a single track. Right. Um, yeah. for for the economy that's coming and you know just as a species we're capable of it so let's go for it right yeah i know i would say that it seems like in education like it just seems like our we have probably with just all the distractions we have uh, not placed as, as high a value on reading is what i think we should well i think it's hard to succeed like i said at the beginning of that the interview like i was an english teacher and i was like Uh, I think I'm doing pretty well, but like I knew there were all these kids and I wasn't reaching them and I had no idea why. Mm. And there wasn't any way to do it. 
you know? Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm excited about technology because I think, uh, you know, things like my tools and there are others out there too. Um, but zinc reading labs is a, is a tool. It's something that, you know, can reach those kids in the back row and find something to engage them with that, you know, maybe can shift the culture a little bit. Right. You know, I, I don't see much, uh, I don't see much uh, truth to, to blaming teachers or schools, you know, and saying, oh, they need to focus more on this. The one thing I will say is the whole emphasis on test prep is completely misplaced. Hmm. And I'm a test prep guru. That's what I do. Like the, the emphasis on test prep needs to be on reading and hmm. vocabulary, but vocabulary in service of reading. Like if you get your students really reading, like, believe me, those tests are not that hard. You know, the hard problem is getting them to, to be readers. And to identify themselves that way, if they feel like readers, they're going to be like excited for the test. Mm -hmm. And even the math parts of the tests are about reading accurately. So, you know, what people think of as test prep, just doing a lot of practice and drill is not test prep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so I guess, you know, from your time there as a teacher and just having a chance to interact with and work with teachers, what advice would you have for teachers as far as working with their students? You know, what, what areas mm -hmm. do you feel like teachers in general could really improve in? Hmm. Um, I think that uh, I, I would recommend any chance you get to actually tutor, which is really hard because I know when I was teaching, you're so exhausted at the end of the day that the last thing you want to do is sit down with someone and, you know, but it just gives you a lot of insight into what's really going on with them. Um, because you're fighting a losing battle if you don't understand that, you know, if you don't understand the challenges that your students face, it makes it very hard to engage them and, you know, get them to really shift their, their behavior and their abilities. Mm. Um, so I think, you know, anything that gives you deeper insight can help you plan more effectively. You know, like if you, if you understand what's really going on with those kids, then maybe you can come up with activities that are going to be more meaningful to them. Mm. So I had a random question that I was curious yeah. about. What, what, what are your thoughts about speed reading? Oh, uh, yeah, they're not my thoughts, but it doesn't exist. It's, it's nonsense. I mean, one of the fascinating things in both of the books I mentioned, the Willingham and the Seidenberg books about reading, mm -hmm. is that um, the, the, most people who are readers consider themselves slow readers, hmm. right? It's sort of like the Lake Wobegon thing, like above average drivers. Um, but most people who are readers consider them slow. I'm an incredibly slow reader. Um, but what that means is the reason I'm a slow reader is that I'm actually processing what I'm reading. Right. So, uh, speed reading is not a thing as the kids say. Uh, it's not a thing. It doesn't exist. If you read fast, you can get all the words going fast, but you actually have to sound out words. Uh, it's, it's really fascinating how the brain turns words from the page into meanings. It's insane. Like how did that even happen? Mm. You know, how, evolutionarily, how could it happen? It, it's only been around for like 5,000 years and it developed in three different places at mm. roughly the same time. What is that? You know, it's mm. a very bizarre thing. But like the, the way it works is your eye has to take in the word, then a part of your brain has to translate that symbol into a sound. And then the sound has to be turned into a meaning. And if all of that doesn't happen, you're not understanding anything. And if you just you know, turn it into a sound, but it doesn't turn into a meaning, you're not understanding anything. So, I mean, you can accelerate a little bit, you'll get faster by practicing, but speed reading doesn't exist. It's just skimming. And then you're not really appreciating or understanding what you're reading. Um, and the real benefits of reading are when you're zinking, you know, when you're really visualizing everything you possibly can and making meaning out of the page, what's on the page. That's what's going to actually not only give you the information, but make you smarter, right? Because it's, it's making your brain work in meaningful ways. 
Hmm. So your, I guess your argument for that person who, who says they're like just a super fast reader is that they're probably just not really digesting it very well. Yeah. There, there are people who read much faster than I do and understand well, but uh, I am pretty slow, I think, uh, as a person. Um, and in the boxing ring, I think I'm pretty slow too. <laughs> but um, I You're think tall that, though, so that helps to make up for it, right? It, a little bit, but the little guys are going to just eat you up, you know. <laughs> um, they just get inside and then you're done. But um, the, uh, the, the, there are people who read faster, but I see a lot of people who read very fast and very sloppily, you know. I mean, no one reads like a barcode scanner. Right. Like when we're reading, there's like this dance between the page and your brain, you know, and like you're going to miss things. And uh, when you really need to read something accurately, like a math problem on a test, like that's the number one problem is that you're, you know, you're, you want your brain to be a barcode scanner. It's not, you know, so you can't force a square peg into a round hole. You have to skip and come back, which is. Uh, a whole other conversation that we'll have another time, Jay. Mm. But um, the the uh, issue of you know being able to read really fast is almost always accompanied by a fairly superficial you know intake of what's on the page, and it can work well for like you know if you're reading like a romance novel, a spy mystery, uh, you know one of these dystopian YA novels, like you don't have to read all the words; you can just kind of inhale it, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but there's value to reading things that require more attention than that. Enormous value. Right. Yeah. What was that book again? You said that the really intense, thick book <laughs> when you mentioned it's not really. thick. It's well, not that thick. It's pretty small. Yeah. It's, uh, it's the conscious mind, the conscious by, mind. Yeah. Yeah. By Zoltan Torre. And he was this really crazy Australian uh, I think he was a psychiatrist, but he was, uh, he was blinded in an accident when he was a kid. Oh, wow. And he, he, uh, was fascinated with the brain. And so he read all the science, you know, like scientific papers and, you know, uh, all the research and somebody would go to all the conferences like an academic, but he wasn't an academic. He was just a, a guy who loved this stuff. Hmm. And I guess he got like Braille versions of everything. Wow. Audio. Um, and so his point is he's digesting all the literature and all the different thinking from biology and uh, neuroscience and psychology and philosophy and all these different things. And he's kind of boiling it down and coming up with his own take on uh, what it means to be a human. Hmm. Well, that's neat. Well, so I guess the last question I have, if, uh, if you had a time machine and you could jump in it and go back to the point in time when you're first thinking about going into education, <laughs> you know, way back, yeah. what, what advice would you go back and give to that younger version of yourself? Uh, I, I, my first thought was like, fasten your seat belts. It's going to be a bumpy ride. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, but like, go for it, man. It's great. It's great. And don't hesitate. Like mm -hmm. really go for it. Like go for it with all your heart and all your passion. Cause it's what God put you on the planet to do. So, you know, if you know, that's the case and you know, I really did from a young age, um, embrace it. And, uh, there's a lot of work to do. Mm. There, there's plenty to do. So, um, you know, get to work. Yeah. Well, so what would you say is the best way to connect with you? All oh, right. So, um, I'm uh, Matt at ZincLearningLabs.com. Uh, if people are interested in a free pilot for the rest of the yeah, year. Yeah, you mentioned that. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, um, they can email partnerships at zinclearninglabs.com. Uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, Matt Bardeen is my Twitter handle. Uh, but Zinc Learning Labs is also on Twitter. And uh, yeah, I think that's 
that's probably about it. Yeah. So now tell us more. You, you mentioned kind of, I think like a beta testing kind of thing. What, tell us a yeah, little bit so more about we that. We are in prototypes about what I think is really the tip of the sphere in terms of making, uh, you know, there's so many middle school and high school kids who just get washed off the boat by their reading uh, level, their reading challenges. And so we're making these close reading games and we're testing prototypes right now. And we're going to go into a little bit broader testing of those uh, really starting in a couple of weeks. And then in the new year, they're going to be rolled out. So um, we are looking for partners who want to really give us a lot of feedback mm. and uh, work with us and preferably from sort of different I mean, we're in New York City, so uh, anybody who's listening in New York City, we'd love to talk to. Um, but also, you know, like accessible to New York is great uh, as well, because, you know, we're interested in seeing how this works in every population and, uh, in, you know, all over the country. So right. not just in New York City. Um, so yeah, we'd love to hear from, from anybody who, who found what I had to say compelling, like, please reach out, yeah. you know, um, and, and we so, for each other. So they just, if they just, uh, emailed you and said, Hey, I'm interested in the beta test with reading games. Is that kind of like, what should they say in an email? Oh, they should say they heard me on your show. First well, of all, of course. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, if they're interested in, um, piloting or in beta testing the, the prototype, if they want to test this close reading games, uh, they should let us know either both or anything, or if they think it's all a stupid idea, uh, I'd love to hear that too. <laughs> it's uh, no, you need to hear, yeah. you, know, you need to hear from people. Um, so, um, you said yeah. it's called close reading games. Yeah, that's that's what we're close we're reading games. Okay. Right now. And then what was the email address one more time if they're interested in that? Partnerships at Zinc Learning Lab. Zinc Z I N C, like the mineral. Okay. So and the mineral that's very important to maintaining life, but trace amounts of it are absolutely necessary, but right. nobody knows about that. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Well, so and I'll make sure to put that in the show notes so people can find it there. Awesome. Great. And so, uh, Edge Leaders, this has been a great interview today. For the show notes of today's show and other resources, visit educatorslead.com and type Matt Bardeen, B A R D I N, into the search tool to find his show notes. Matt, thank you for sharing your journey with us today. Thank you, Jay. It was really fun. And that wraps up another episode of Educators Lead. This podcast is brought to you by MoMetrics, the number one test preparation company. MoMetrics offers study materials for over 1,800 different exams, including the SAT, ACT, GED, end-of-course exams, state standard exams like the STAR, teacher certification exams, advanced placement, CLEP, ASVAB, GRE, and so many more. MoMetrics takes the mountains of information students could be tested over for any given exam and boils it all down to just the fluff-free golden nuggets of information that are most likely to be on the exam. They couple that with some great study tips and test-taking strategies to help students maximize their test scores. With their interactive tutorial videos and a layout that makes lesson planning easy, MoMetrics study guides, flashcards, and practice questions are a great fit for individual or classroom use. To learn more about our products and our vault of hundreds of free tutorial videos, please visit educatorslead.com forward slash test prep. That's educatorslead.com forward slash test prep. Edu leaders, thank you for joining us on Educators Lead. Visit us at educatorslead.com for everything we talked about today, free resources, and much, much more. 